For about 10 years, my, uh, my brother Mike had a, a place out in Wyoming, and it was a, a beautiful house, and, and in the duration of his ownership, we made it out there probably three or four times on different vacations. And, and one of the places where we would always go was a, a big canyon, and off to the side of the canyon was a small trail that went up to a, a place that was known as Bridal Veil Falls. And it was a, a gorgeous spot, and an arduous hike, but always worth, worth the trip. We could see the, the water coming off the top of the cliff and pouring down un, untouched for, 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 I don't know, 50, 100 feet. It was gorgeous. The, the passage that, that uh, Linda just read this morning pours from the Apostle Paul's pen something like a waterfall. For, for the duration of its existence, people have, have tried to, to, to get on top of it, to, to channel its powerful currents, to organize the, the torrents of what Paul says here in, 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 in observable streams of thought. But Paul just gushes on and on and on about God's grace in Jesus Christ, about the wonder of election, about what God is up to in our lives, how he's trying to adopt us as his children to make us holy and blameless. And he stretches from one end of eternity all the way into our lives and beyond. As, as he pours forth this incredible praise of what God is up to and what God is doing. And so this morning I want to spend some time with you thinking about Grace Falls, about this place in Scripture where God's grace spouts out of the rock and comes pouring down, surging in ways that are much too fast and, and too broad for us to imagine or to handle. And though we won't be able to talk about everything that we see go by us here, I think we can identify three different things that go by in the stream before us. Election is one of the big ones. Incorporation into Christ and his life. And finally, we'll talk about imagination how we see ourselves, how we see the world around us in light of what the Apostle Paul has to say here in this passage. First of all, election. Ephesians 1 verse 4, the fact that, that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world is a verse that has been important to reform people, important to Protestant people since the time of the Reformation and beyond. It's a passage of, of incredible comfort, both in God's love for us and in God's sovereignty. But as people think about, about election, people being people with inquiring minds, they, they, have, they have all kinds of different questions. It's, it's not ever enough to, 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 to take what's given to us and to say thanks. We, we wonder what's upstream from that election that Paul writes about. We wonder if, if we're elect, are those there out there who are not elect? And if not, why not? We, we wonder about, about a God who, who chooses us, who determines in a certain sense our fate. Does he leave any freedom for us at all? We wonder what makes God tick. Is he, is he capricious in his actions? Does he have reasons for what he does? And so we stand at the foot of this incredible fall of God's grace, and yet we try and see beyond it. We try and imagine why God does what he does. I, I read a commentary this week that, that attempted to answer, well, not so much answer the questions as, as reorient our focus as, as, as we try to take in this incredible teaching about God's electing love. 
His name is, is George Straub, and he writes in Feasting on the Word. He notes that, that for theologians like Augustine, Luther, Calvin, and Edwards, this passage is about the wonder of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And he writes, it's an affirmation that the God Christians know in Jesus Christ is gracious beyond the wildest reaches of our imaginations. He also mentions the gospel, or the good news of God's sovereignty. I don't know about you, but I can't keep track of my cell phone or my car keys. <laughs> Aren't you glad that, that your salvation is in God's hands? and not yours? Isn't the sovereignty of God the fact that he has known things and controlled things and taken care of things, some of the best news that you could possibly hear? Straub goes on to talk about how uh, not only is God sovereign, not only does this election reflect his incredible love to us in Jesus, but he talks about that whole business of, of being adopted as well. God doesn't require a certain bloodline or national identity. His grace goes beyond blood and soil. And added to that is the fact that the God who has called us before the foundation of the world, he hasn't just called us to remind us that we have reservations for a room in paradise. He's called us to do something. He's called us in each and every occasion to be involved in this incredible flow of his grace in the world around us. That's, that's what Paul wants us to know and to remember as he reminds us of God's electing grace and love in verses 4 and 11. This theme of election is also meant to give us a, a new and more accurate sense of our history. We're going to talk about imagination in a little bit, and we'll talk about it a little more deeply, but it's appropriate here as well. Our history, think about what you think of yourself. Think of the, the story you tell yourself about who you are. Our history has, has something to do with things that have actually happened, but it's also wrapped up in our imaginations, the stories that we tell us about what has happened and how it has affected who we are. Maybe your father was too hard on you. Maybe your mother criticized you. Maybe you felt like a, a, a victim of your circumstances all your life. Maybe, maybe you've developed a, a story of your past that has to do with all the wrongs that have been done to you. Or, or, or maybe you've developed a story for yourself that, 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 that has more heroic proportions in which you see yourself as, as the good one or even the hero in just about every circumstance. The story that Paul means to provide for us here in this passage where, where grace comes sporting forth, spouting forth, is, is the story not of our achievement or of our failure, but it's the story of God's love for us in Jesus Christ. And it's the story of, of, of a God who loves us so deeply that he provides for us that new sense of who we are as members of his family. It's grace, not what we've done or failed to do, that brings us into this family and into the, the story of what's going on in the world around us. Finally, belonging in terms of election. Barbara Brown Taylor in The Preaching Life describes this idea of being chosen and utterly and thoroughly loved as she recalls one of her grandmothers who lavished her love on her grandchildren, she writes. When they came to visit, there were special treats, piles of presents, and long, lazy afternoons together. And each child received a night of pampering. When my night came, she treated me to like long-lost royalty, filling the tub with suds, and then beckoning me in where she washed each of my limbs in turn and polished my skin with her great soft sponge. After she had dried me off, she anointed me with Jurgen's lotion and then reached for her dusting powder, Evening in Paris, and tickled me all over with a pale blue puff. When she had done, I knew I was precious. I was absolutely convinced I was loved. The real intent of the doctrine of election is to give us a, a similar sense 
of God's incredible love for us. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Well, there's obviously some differences between Grandma's bubble bath and the Christian life. God certainly beckons us in, and he longs to leave us even cleaner than Grandma's bubble bath. The words I want to focus on now as we move from election to incorporation are, are the words in him. And as you look at this passage, maybe you noticed it, maybe you didn't, but Paul repeats that notion of being incorporated into Christ in him nine times in the verses that we read together. In almost every verse, that notion of being included in Jesus Christ is there. And that got me to thinking about Niagara Falls and going over in barrels. You've, you've seen stories, right? You've, you've read the history of, of, of people who've gone to Niagara Falls and looked at it and thought, boy, I ought to go over that in a barrel. Well, it, it, it's true. And, and I, I remembered as a child reading some, some stories about adventurers who, who attempted that. Some survived, some didn't. And if you're curious, you can look at Wikipedia, list of things that have gone over Niagara Falls, and it'll give you the whole, the whole, the whole deal. The first one recorded was in 1901 on October 24, when a woman by the name of Annie Edson Taylor went over in a barrel. She was mostly unharmed, but exited the barrel bleeding. They've got a picture of her next to her barrel on which she's described as the heroine of Niagara Falls. And in the following decades, there were all manners of adventurers and daredevils who tried to go over, most of them unsuccessfully. One tragic story of a guy who went over in, in, in an airtight steel barrel. He got lodged at the bottom of the falls. He survived the fall, but he ran out of air before they could rescue him, and, and he suffocated. In 1990, somebody went over in a kayak wearing a helmet, thankfully. He, he had... He had made reservations downriver, but he never made it to dinner reservations that night or any other. And in 1995, somebody tried in a jet ski with a, with a parachute, also unsuccessfully. I know, on, on one hand, it seems inappropriate to, to compare being in Christ as we go through Grace Falls with being in a barrel as someone goes over Niagara Falls. But on the other hand, I've, I've come across this quote from Dietrich Bonhoeffer at least three times in the last two weeks. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. Last week we talked about the centrality of Christ's death in both the epistles and the gospel narratives. And it's important to recognize that, that being in Christ necessarily means that we have died to ourselves. I mean, it's, it's baptism 101. We are submerged with Christ into his death in order to be raised up into his life. And so when we talk about being in Christ, it's not at all inappropriate to talk about being wrapped up in his death with a view to rising again with him into new life. And there's one more difference between the baptismal identity that the, and, and Barbara Brown grandma's bubble bath, and it's that, that in Christ we're, we're united not just with Jesus, but in Christ we are united and grafted into the, the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ brings all of us in, and we become one together. And in, in verse 10, Paul talks about that, that vision of all things coming together under Christ. And that work begins and goes on in the church of Jesus Christ as we come together to experience his grace as his body. And one of the biggest parts of that grace is the very fact that people who are broken apart, people who are angry with each other, people who have nothing in common, they come together 
and they experience the life of Christ as one. It's what we're headed for. It's also what we experience as we are incorporated in him. Well, I want to finish up this morning by, by returning to the whole idea of imagination. I said earlier that how we conceive of ourselves and our histories is as much imagination as it is reality. We're all novelists. We all tell ourselves stories about who we are. And our culture is fully engaged in spinning yarns as well. Advertisers, in particular, have a pretty clear message of, of who they want to tell us we are and what we need in order to survive, what makes us tick. And the storyline of the world around us, well, it hits us something like with the force of, of Niagara Falls. Every time you look at the, the, the screen on your cell phone, Every time you look at your tablet, your computer screen, your television screen, the movie screen, every time you have the earbuds in your head or the headphones on, every time you absorb from the people around you something of what the world is telling you about who you are, well, you know how rivers can change the landscape in, what, in which they're found, don't you? The, the, the torrents of the story about who we are flow through our lives and shape our minds, our hearts, and our imaginations as well. And it's precisely for that reason that the Apostle Paul describes a different view of reality and tries to help us see what's really going on. Timothy Gombas, author of the drama of Ephesians, writes this of both the, the present reality and the future. He says, my guess is that those who are reading this book, his book, are probably like me, doing pretty well in the world, enjoying a fairly comfortable life as we travel the road of upwardly mobile middle class America. We too desperately need a heavenly vision of reality so that we will not be hoodwinked into thinking that life is all about maintaining social status and accumulating stuff. Simply by living in the world and going through our day-to-day -day patterns of life, this conviction is subtly reinforced to us that this is all there is. It is supremely difficult to envision our lives from the conviction that Christ is the cosmic ruler of all things. And ultimately, that's exactly what Paul wants us to be reminded of, wants us to live under. He wants to change the story that shapes and determines our lives. What Paul talks about in this explosion of cascading praise is precisely what is real. It's what we all believe about the future. It's why we gather together here on Sundays. But the Apostle Paul wants to take what we believe about the future, what God has done for us, that notion of salvation that we have, and he wants to bring it to us where we are. So that shapes not only our conceptions of where we're going, but of who we are and what we're doing here and now. The author Gombas continues, Ephesians 1 verses 3 to 14 works on the imagination of a community in order to shape it forming characters who will inhabit the gospel drama faithfully. Just as advertising does, Paul assaults the imagination with life-giving realities that catch up readers into the truth of what God is doing in the world through his people. Sisters and brothers, God means to catch all of us up, not only in the life after, ever after, but in the drama of salvation that he is carrying out even as we speak. Yes, we're chosen, but to be one of God's chosen, one of his beloved, is as much about what God has us doing here and now in the world in which we live as it is about the future that waits after we die. It's to be caught up in this stream of praise that's reflected not only in what we do here on Sunday mornings for an hour, but this, this splashing praise of Paul about the, the grace of God that cascades over the top and splashes into our lives is, is meant to get our wallets wet as well. It's meant to saturate our political views. 
It's meant even to dampen the hostility that we feel towards people who are not like us or may not agree with us. This cascade of grace is the flow of Jesus Christ in the world, which, when it reaches its fulfillment, will bring everything together as one. Grace falls, creating one pool. In verse 10, Paul sums things up before looking again at the incredible falls of grace, of God's grace for us in the following verses. And he writes about how God is to bring unity to all things on heaven and on earth under Christ. The news media tells us the world is cracking up. Old alliances are falling apart. The trade war is accelerating our doom. Democracy is crumbling, if, if you believe the cover of, of Time magazine in this past edition. And ladies and gentlemen, if you can believe it, our president stepped in front of the queen. Certainly the world is about to come to an end. But victory isn't achieved through alliances or military might or even as important as they may be through Supreme Court justices. The real storyline of the universe is played out in church basements where homeless people are fed and housed. The real storyline of the kingdom of God is played out when God's people gather together around the, the poured out blood of their Savior, the broken body of their Savior, and accept not only his promise for the future, but his call for life in Christ here and now. The real storyline is not what you read in the newspapers. It's not what culture is telling us about. The real storyline is that grace falls and Christ rules. Believe it and live it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks this morning for the outpouring of your love in Jesus Christ. We give you thanks for, for being a God who is sovereign and who has known us and loved us since before the creation of the world. We give you thanks for the opportunity to participate in your grace, not only receiving it, but sharing it with those who are around us. Father, we pray that we will leave here and that we will leave our, live our lives saturated and dripping with the grace that Paul here writes about. Thank you for the opportunity to gather together around your table. Bless us and nourish us as we do so. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.